Bees, like the ones found in this colony here, forage for food, nectar and pollen, over a territory that surrounds the hive. To do so, they must navigate around their territory. That is, they must have some sense of their own place in the world, reference to direction and distance from the hive. When bees find a patch of flowers to exploit, for example, they have to know where they are with respect to the hive. To tell their hive mates where the patch is, they need to know the direction and distance they must fly to find it, and the direction and distance they must fly back to the hive. All require some sense of place and some ability to navigate. Navigation requires some sort of reference. When we navigate from place to place, the reference is generally the North Magnetic Pole, which we find using a magnetic compass. When we head off in a particular direction, our heading is with reference to the North Magnetic Pole. All we need then to navigate is some means of measuring distance. Bees may be able to sense magnetic north, and this means they may use magnetic north as a navigation aid as well. Mostly, though, they navigate their world using the position of the sun in the sky as a navigation beacon. That is, they use a sun compass. We're familiar with the concept of the sun compass. We use the position of the sun in the sky all the time to get a sense of which direction is north, south, east, and west. How do bees do it? Do they just look for the sun in the sky and say to themselves, oh, there's the sun, I'll just go this way? That's unlikely, obviously. Rather, bees locate the sun through a sophisticated sense, a sense that we do not have. Specifically, bees locate the sun by sensing polarized light. To understand how bees do this will mean first understanding what polarized light is. Once we have that under our belts, we can explore how bees use polarized light in the sky as a navigation aid. Polarized light is the consequence of the dual nature of light. Light can be imagined as a particle, a photon traveling through space in a straight line. Simultaneously, light can be imagined as a wave. In this conception, light is described as a form of electromagnetic radiation. Polarization of light is a phenomenon of the wave nature of light. Let's look at a light ray as a photon traveling through space. In its waveform, light can be resolved into two complementary wave functions. There is an electric wave which oscillates in amplitude of energy. This oscillation is known as the E vector. At the same time, the energy exists as a complementary wave of magnetic energy. The amplitude of that wave oscillates out of phase to form the H vector or magnetic vector. The direction of oscillation of the H vector is orthogonal, that is, perpendicular to the direction of oscillation of the E vector. As always, conservation of energy applies. The sum of energy in the E vector and H vector is a constant, which is the energy carried in the photon. Thus, when the E vector is at its maximum, the H vector must be zero. When the H vector is at its maximum, the E vector must be zero. We're all familiar with this phenomenon. If you have polarizing filters in your sunglasses, you've dealt with polarized light. Polarizing filters can be useful for reducing glare from reflected sunlight, such as sunlight reflecting from the surface of a lake. When the polarizing filter is rotated one way, the glare is quite bright. When it's rotated 90 degrees perpendicular, the reflected glare can be reduced. The effect is most evident when the reflected light is from the sky only. When the polarizing filter is rotated to allow the reflection through, the surface of the water appears nearly opaque. This is the light reflected from the sky itself. When the filter is rotated 90 degrees, this reflected light is strongly filtered out, and you can now clearly see to the bottom. How does this work? Let's take a reflective surface and imagine the sun is shining down on it. There will be an incident beam consisting of many photons. When the beam strikes the reflective surface, photons will be reflected. 
If the surface is opaque, like, say, the shiny surface of the hood of a car, all the photons will be reflected. If the surface is clear, like the surface of a body of water, some of the photons will be reflected and some will be refracted. If that reflected beam streams to the eye, that will be perceived as glare. If we look at the beams in cross-section, so to speak, we can begin to tease out what we mean by polarization. Let's look at the orientation of the E-vectors in the incident beam. Imagine looking at the beam straight on, through a kind of hoop, if you will. The orientation of the E-vectors here is random. This is unpolarized light. When the beam encounters the reflective surface, there is reorientation of the E-vectors. In the refracted beam, the E-vectors become oriented more or less vertically. In the reflected beam, the E-vectors are realigned to be almost uniformly horizontal. The reflected beam is therefore polarized. A polarizing filter works by filtering out light beams that have a specific orientation of the E-vector. Polarizing filters act as a sort of grating. When the grating is oriented parallel to the E-vectors, those light beams are allowed through. If the grating is rotated to become perpendicular to the E-vectors, beams with horizontal E-vectors will not be allowed through. Because reflected light is usually polarized, it is a reflected light that is blocked by a polarizing filter. What has all this to do with polarized light and sun compasses? The polarization of light in the sky comes from a phenomenon known as Rayleigh scattering, named after a British physicist, Lord Rayleigh. Before he was Lord Rayleigh, he was John William Strutt. Rayleigh scattering is what makes the daytime sky blue and what imparts the brilliant reds and oranges to the sky at sunrise and sunset. Rayleigh scattering occurs when light interacts with particles that are smaller than the wavelength of the light. That's certainly true for the atmosphere. Both oxygen molecules and nitrogen molecules are about 300 picometers in diameter. That's 300 times 10 to the minus 12th power. Compare this to the wavelengths of visible light, which range from about 300 to 700 nanometers, or 300,000 to 700,000 picometers. So, light from the sun should scatter strongly as it passes through the atmosphere and interacts with all those small molecules of nitrogen and oxygen gas. The magnitude of scattering depends upon wavelength, Longer wavelengths, those to the red end of the spectrum, scatter less than shorter wavelengths, those toward the blue end of the spectrum. This is why the sky appears blue. Looking to a point high in the sky, away from the sun, the sky's color is intense blue. This is because it's the blue wavelengths that are more likely to be scattered to the surface, where they can be seen. Looking to a point in the sky closer to the sun, the sky appears more white. This is because the light reaching the ground has scattered less and the spectrum of light is more evenly distributed. But what has this to do with polarization? For that, we have to delve a bit more deeply into what happens when a photon of light interacts with a small molecule of oxygen or nitrogen in the air. The molecule consists of a nucleus, and surrounding electron shells. When a photon intercepts the molecule, it interacts with the electrons in the orbital shells. That interaction takes place through the photon's E-vector. The photon is therefore refracted, and the incident photon's E-vector is rotated so that it is perpendicular to the direction of scatter. This affects the distribution of polarization of the light from the sky. When light comes from points in the sky closer to the sun, the light is not polarized. Not only are the wavelengths distributed across the spectrum, making those portions of the sky appear white, the polarization is small. E-vectors are oriented randomly because there is little Rayleigh scattering. Farther from the sun, the polarization is more marked because light from that portion of the sky results from extensive Rayleigh scattering. Not only does Rayleigh scattering make the sky appear blue, the light coming from that point is also most strongly polarized. 
It is this distribution of polarization of light from the sky that makes a sun compass possible. Light rays radiating from the sun point to the location of the sun in the sky. A bee cannot always see where in the sky the sun is, but the plane of polarization provides a reliable indicator. The plane of polarization will always be perpendicular to the light beam. If the plane of polarization can be sensed, a bee looking at the sky will be able to locate the position of the sun in the sky. All planes of polarization will be perpendicular to the sun. Furthermore, the polarization will be most intense the further from the sun you look, which provides an additional cue. Farthest from the sun, the polarization is most intense because light from that part of the sky has experienced the most intense Rayleigh scattering. Closer to the sun, the polarization is less intense because the light emanating from that part of the sky has experienced lesser Rayleigh scattering. This cue allows the sun to be located even if it cannot be seen directly. We'll demonstrate this in a moment. So, if the plane of polarization of light from the sky can be sensed, you have the elements of a compass that points to the sun, just as reliably as a magnetic compass needle points to magnetic north. Navigating by sun compass is a little more complicated than by magnetic compass. Magnetic north is a fixed reference. Navigating to other fixed points can reference magnetic north at any time of the day or year. The reference does not move. The sun, in contrast, moves through the sky during the day. Navigating to a fixed point, like a patch of flowers or a beehive, must take into account the movement of the reference point, the sun, with time. We have to introduce some vocabulary to see how that happens. Let's look straight up into the sky. We position the camera so that the cardinal points, north, south, east, and west, are positioned with north at the top. I'm using a fisheye lens to provide a fairly complete picture of the sky from horizon to horizon. Topologically, the sky is a hemisphere, and we describe the position of something in the sky with a polar coordinate system. The zero point or origin of the polar coordinate system of the sky is the zenith. The zenith is the point in the sky directly overhead, so it is reference to wherever on earth you are. The term zenith is often conflated with the zenith angle. They are different. The zenith is the origin of the polar coordinate system of the sky. The zenith angle is one of two polar coordinates that describes the position of something like the sun in the sky. The zenith angle can be mapped out onto the sky as a series of circles at intervals, say 30 degrees, 60 degrees, 80 degrees, and so forth. These are the equivalents of grid lines on a coordinate plane. The zenith angle alone cannot locate the position of the sun. At a given zenith angle, an object could be located anywhere along the circle that represents the zenith angle. To pin down the position, a second coordinate is needed. This is the azimuth. The azimuth can be represented as a rosette. By convention, north is an azimuth of 0 degrees, east is 90 degrees azimuth, south is 180 degrees, west is 270 degrees, and so forth. The position of an object in the sky is represented by a coordinate pair. Rather than the xy coordinates of a coordinate plane, the polar coordinates are zenith angle and azimuth, represented with a Greek theta and phi. The position of this cartoon sun in the sky is about 30 degrees zenith angle and 35 degrees azimuth, respectively. During the day, the sun follows a course through the sky that starts in the east, with zenith angles and azimuths that vary through the day. In the northern hemisphere, where we are now, the sun's course is entirely in the southern half of the sky. When we turn the camera to look horizontally, these coordinates appear a little differently. Now, the azimuth is a coordinate line that marches from east to west. 
The camera here is facing south, so that the center of the frame is oriented due south or at an azimuth of 180 degrees, ranging from an azimuth of 90 degrees in the east to 270 degrees in the west. The zenith angles for their parts are represented by a series of curves across the sky. Zenith angle is sometimes represented as elevation angle, which is the angle from the horizon, not the zenith. Elevation angle, represented here in yellow characters, is the complement of the zenith angle, represented in white characters. The sum of zenith angle and elevation angle is always 90 degrees. During the day, the azimuth and elevation angles of the sun change continuously as the sun makes its march through the sky. The beauty of using polarized light detection to see where in the sky the sun is, is that you don't actually have to see the sun to be able to do it. Now put yourself in the position of the bees living in this hive right here. They're located under a canopy of leaves. This is not an uncommon situation for beehives to be in. The trees try to fill in the canopy with leaves as much as possible. They do this to be able to capture as much light as possible. But there are gaps that appear in the canopy, and this is where you can see the sky, even if you can't see the sun itself. Now, imagine you're a worker bee coming out of the hive. You've been told by one of your nestmates that there's a tasty patch of flowers to be exploited 90 degrees to the right of the position of the sun in the sky. How do you know where to go if you can't see the sun? Well, this is where polarized light sensitivity comes in handy. Now we set up a camera here to give us a kind of a bee's eye view of what the sky would look like. And we've got it pointed straight up, which is the direction of the bee's own polarized light detectors. We've got a polarizing filter on it. And so we're seeing the sky uh, as if the bee would see it. Uh, the bottom of the frame is oriented to the south, and of course the top is oriented to the, to the north, and so forth. All right, well, let's see what a bee would see if it can detect its polarized light in the sky. If we rotate the polarizing filter, we see that there are certain patches of the sky that become quite dark and intensely blue. Those are areas where the uh, light coming from the sky is the most polarized. And if we turn the polarizing filter so that that patch of the sky becomes the most intensely blue, then and we look with our pointers where the uh, in the sky the sun is, it's pointing right to where I know the sun is in the sky, but where a bee might not be able to tell if it's under the canopy. So we know that that's a line that's going to point uh, along uh, directly towards the sun. But we still don't know exactly where in the sky the sun is, because it could be pointing that way or that way. So if we rotate the uh, orientation of the polarizing filter again, we see that there are other patches of the sky where it doesn't change all that much. So again, if we rotate it through the whole uh, a range of orientations. We see that uh, that patch down there in the uh, bottom left part of the frame is not changing much at all. Now we know from how polarized light is distributed in the sky that the area of the sky where the polarization is most intense, that's in the upper right hand part of the frame, is located farthest away from the sun in the sky. On the other hand, those patches of sky where the, orienta the orientation of the polarization vector, where the light is not so intensely polarized, those are areas of the sky that are closest to the sun. So with those two cues, uh, the location in the sky of the most intense polarization and the orientation of the polarization vectors, then that B will know that to go 90 degrees uh, to the right of the position of the sun in the sky, that she will have to go in that direction right there. And that's how bees use polarized light to navigate by the sun.